The following pre recorded program is sponsored by Adams Financial Concepts. Welcome to About Money, a different approach to investing you won't hear anywhere else. Your hosts, the AFC team, Mike and Al, are registered investment advisors who have a proven track record of managing long-term investments surpassing the markets. The information shared on the following program is for educational purposes only, and any investment advice given may not be suitable for all investors. And now, here's your AFC team, Mike and Al. And we're here to talk about money. It is Saturday. And you know, this past week, the consumer price index number came in, the producer price index came in, both were up for a second month in a row. We've been alerting people that there could be a change of inflation. Is this the beginning? I mean, one point doesn't make a trend, two points make a line, but they don't make a trend. But we think that there may be something going on. There's been a lot of talk about six Rate drops six times to drop the rate, interest rate. Yeah, Kathy Wood was the one who mentioned that. I don't know who else came up there, but I saw her. A few others. CNBC had it going for a long time. Mm -hmm. Now a few people are saying three instead. I, think with, I heard two, two. I think another two. I've one. heard two. Yeah. Do I hear one? <laughs> Do I hear zero? It's very possible. Zero or one or two this year? Inflation's funny, Mike. It's like that, you know, it's it's like weight loss, right? To uh, you, get, you get the first big move and then the stomp out that last few percent is really, really difficult. But it's also a difference in what we've been seeing is demand pull. Yeah. And that's where you have too many dollars chasing too few products. Mm -hmm. You have people with stimulus checks with, with those checks and no place to spend it because they were sheltering in. And then you have a shortage of supply. You had a shortage of cars being made because of chips. You had a shortage of refrigerator motors, so refrigerators weren't in, weren't in supply. You had a lot of supply that was had to be geared back up. The shut, plants had been shut down, but people had a lot of money to spend, and they were spending it. And so you had a demand pull. Remember, car prices shot through the roof. Used, used car prices were just as expensive, so people just said, oh, I'll just buy brand new. There's no point in buying a used car. I know. I had a friend who had a Mercedes, and he said the Mercedes, he leases the car. And the Mercedes people called him up. This is a year, 18 months ago, maybe two years ago. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. Uh, but the Mercedes people called him up and said, your lease is going to be up in six months. If you bring the car in, we'll give you a $5 bonus we to lease a new car. Yeah, yeah, same thing happened with buddy of mine with the BMW. They said, yeah, bring it back in. We'll just give you a brand new one to, yeah. you know. So that that was the man pull. But what cost push is, is when you have wages increasing or or materials. But we've seen materials come down, right? Materials haven't. So it's wages. We've talked about this before, that how can you stomp out inflation in with in, or, or, or we talked about it first in the context of the recession. How can you have a recession with such a tight labor market where people can go and then get a new job and make more money? Yeah. And how can you st now at the, on the reverse on, on the reverse? How can you stomp out inflation when you still have a really tight labor market? You have four million more jobs than you have workers to yeah. fill those jobs. Yeah. And what we're seeing is more strikes. Last year, 17 million man days lost or person days, I guess, to be politically correct. But 17 million days lost due to strike. Yeah. That's more than the previous 10 years combined. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing wages increase at 4.5% and productivity at only 1.2%. Mm -hmm. I was speaking of weight loss drugs, I, I, weight loss. I was read, read an article about the, the GLP-1 one drug, and they think they're going to have an impact on the economy by increasing productivity and getting more people back to the label. There'll be a loss involved of pounds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they think it's gonna it, that it could increase productivity because more people will come back to the labor force. What does that do if, to inflation over the next few years if that's the case? It would be positive, but you still need to bring in three or four million more people. Yeah, they say there's a lot of people on the sidelines that stepped away and the, the unproductive because because of the obesity epidemic. And they said if that because you can lose up to uh, I believe a third of your body weight drug. It's it's, it's significant. Great. It's not it's not you know just trivial amount of weight that people are losing. Yeah. No, it's very positive for the for the drugs. But in the meantime, until we see the impact, and that's going to be a lagging thing, mm -hmm. we're seeing labor rates increase, no sign of slowing down, and that's pushing up inflation because the companies can see that their costs are rising. And so when costs rise, what do they do? Increase your prices. Or, 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 or what other thing that's going on, Mike, is shrinkflation. Yeah. 
you know, your bag of potato chips. Wait a second, the chips are a little bit smaller and the bag's a little bit lighter. <laughs> Seattle Times have been doing that for decades. <laughs> <laughs> the paper's smaller and smaller and smaller? Yeah. More, more ads and less content? Actually, not as many ads because they're losing oh, no way. Yeah. revenue. Yeah. They yeah. lost the classifieds. Oh, the classifieds are gone. I'm just talking the, 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 the ones that the insert ads that go in. Yeah. So anyway, we're going to come back and talk about this. I mean, many, I'm not sure how many people really understand the difference between demand pull and cost push. I've told it, talked about it before being at the, conf, or the luncheon with First Trust. And they're pretty sharp guys. And when I asked the question about demand pull or cost push inflation, the response was, inflation's inflation. Yeah. I mean, you know. Plus what, what's going on in the Red Sea, you had a little bit of bottleneck inflation too, which, you know, not necessarily as bad as it was a few years ago. I'm not saying it's maybe not statistically significant. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But it has been causing some disruption in the supply chain. It has. All that. We're going to come back to that and talk about that. We have a guest today who's here. He was on the program in 2015. He's got a new company. We're going to be talking about that. So you want to hear what he has to say. And we maybe get to talking about some of the ways in which we manage money. But first, let's, let's talk about what's gone on. Because in 2011, I began talking about a super cycle, a period of time in which the GDP of the world grew at a faster rate than average. The first cycle was from 1870 to 1913. 43 years, driven by the industrialization of the U.S. The second cycle was from 1970 to 1945, driven by the rebuilding of Europe and the decolonization of Africa and Asia. Third cycle started in 2009 and is expected to last until 2030. A lot of people talked about the super cycle up until COVID hit. And since COVID, nobody's really talked about the super cycle. People are saying, what super cycle? Um, yeah, but I think, I think COVID... Enhance the super. I, I, I mean, you talked about that so maybe maybe a couple of years ago, right after COVID, because of the changes in the way they're processing the how slow the FDA was, right? When they instituted how to get that drug to the to the goal line as fast as they could, and they did an amazing job doing that. That those changes could actually enhance the super cycle for development for not just drugs, but a lot of other things getting through pipelines for products and things, especially yeah. with the advent of, of an artificial intelligence. And the world is really flat. I mean, there, there was a time at which a lot of information existed in the United States at the universities. Mm -hmm. But so, because of the internet, that information is available everywhere. In the, you know, I did some, some work in the country of Georgia and in the Ukraine at one time. And they had access to everything we do on the internet. They just plug, open up their computer, Log in. They can Google. They have Gmail accounts. They can they can see what we see. But the, but the advent of the the mnra uh, vaccines was a, a game changer, I and mean, getting it through in nine months a massive accomplishment. Yeah, you know, things like that. The things are moving faster and faster with the advent of AI. We've seen that just take off, and we're in the, we're in the infancy stages of it's it's very reminiscent of of the dot coms. It is, but yeah, it you is. You know, in the early day. I used to say for the internet, if you looked at Microsoft, what was happening is that computer memories were doubling every 18 months. And that allowed Microsoft and Oracle and the software companies to continue to increase the amount of script that they were writing. Um, at one time, back in the, at the end of the 80s, early 90s, I looked at the, the number of lines of script in Word was 10 times what it was for the space shuttle to go to the moon. I mean, but be because computer memories were doubling every 18 months, it allowed computer companies and software companies to write a lot more script. That was 18 months for computer memories to double. The internet was doubling every six months. Mm -hmm. And I said, the real question is how to monetize it. AI, it's going to be the same thing. How do you monetize? How do you get paid for it? How do you use it? How do companies use it? There are going to be some of those companies that really understand how to use it and others that come along and maybe write a business plan or may have a thing that says we know how to use AI that truly are just blowing up a storm mm -hmm. without anything real. I think you're also AI accelerating businesses. So you're going to create a greater divide between having not the access understanding to build a business successful or scale that those that are access be further behind and slower. To yeah, I think that was true of the internet. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, the companies that were able to 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 figure out how to do a web page, how to do uh, that information, we're much further ahead. I can remember going to a seminar at one time where people talked about the number of people that were checking web pages to verify 
the credibility of a company, it was like 90%. Anyway, we'll come back to that and finish this right after this commercial break. Don't go away. We'll be right back. About Money with your AFC team, Mike and Al, on AM 1300, The Answer. For more information, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. So I want to finish a thought I, I started and I only got partway through. I said that I went through a conference early in the days of the, the internet and people were, over 90% of people were checking the validity of companies, but fewer than 50% of the companies at that time had internet or had a, a website is what I to say. Fewer than 50% had a website. And so those companies that didn't have a website were being considered not not viable and that cost them business. And your comment, Kevin, that the people that understand AI are going to be the ones that are ahead. And those that, that don't understand and don't participate and don't understand and don't, they're going to be left behind. It happened with the internet. Take it way, way back. It happened with electricers. It happened with lighting and factories and electricity. I mean, well, I think it goes way back. I think it was mocked by stock and American telephone. Oh, those are stupid. Nobody's ever going to want to use one of those. That's true. <laughs> That's a true story. And no, it, it worked out. Who has a landline anymore? Yeah, exactly. Uh, anyway, coming back to this, during the last great inflationary period of time, one of the best hedges was commodities. Oil soared from less than $10 a barrel to over 60, a six-fold increase in just a period of 18 months, 10 to 60. Platinum soared tenfold. Think today if oil surged from its current price to over 400 bucks a barrel. Think of what you'd pay for gasoline. I mean, all of that. But as, as inflation hit, stocks did not do well. Bonds did terribly because as interest rates went up, bond prices went down. But even as stocks hit 1,000 in 1966, then they sold off 20%. And then they rose back to 1,000, and then they sold off to 30%. They rose back to 1,000, and then they sold off 40%. Back to 1,000, and then sold off 20%. And finally, in August of 82, 16 years later, the Dow finally passed the 1,000 mark, and then went on to 11,000 in 2000. But in those days, you could invest in oil companies early on. They would also suffer later in the, the time. Uh, but commodities were a place to be. The question is, will commodities be a place now? No, and they haven't proven they've, they've, they've done terrible. Most commodities are down, I think, 29% from their high. And is it a temporary situation, or do you think we're going to see commodity prices rise? It depends on which commodity you're talking about. Oil, I we talk about all the time, peak oil. <laughs> we can come back to peak oil. <laughs> I think oil is going to continue to rise. I don't think production is going to continue. I know you say that gasol the, the peak gasoline is different than peak oil was 2018 at yeah. peak because we don't ref, we don't refine any. But I still think that the the countries that are industrial will pick up the slack. The commodities, wheat as wheat and these other commodities, uh, we've seen lithium and those commodities that were really high in 2021, lithium and cobalt and nickel, which make electric batteries. We've seen those drop precipitously. Nickel's down 50% and lithium's down almost. But how much of the, the increase was due to speculation? I think a lot. a lot. I think a lot of speculation in lithium and a lot of, especially in the, in the nickel industry, which is tightly controlled by, uh, I think, a few. There was that, what was that company that guy was trying to corner the nickel? Uh, Chagos? Was, I was don't it? remember. You remember in 2021, there was a guy in Britain, he was trying to corner the nickel market. He got pinched. Yeah. And he got, his whole hedge fund went belly up as uh, he bet the wrong way. The thing went side. He was trying to corner the whole market. Sounds like the Hunt Brothers and Silver. Yeah. Way, way back when. Yeah. But uh, so I, I don't know if we'll see commodity. You know, one of the problems is commodities are something that you have to mine. And companies are becoming, governments are becoming more and more regular, taking more and more regulation and slowing down the process of, you can't just go buy a bulldozer and start sho shovel or whatever But here's the it thing, is. like gold prices are rising, have been rising fast too. Gold prices. And I don't think, that, like you said, mining mining is it's labor intensive, extremely expensive. And it's not, this is, you know, it's not environmentally. That's not like, it's a zero, it's not like going to EVs is a zero sum solution because you got to mine all the material. Yep. And countries are beginning to realize if you can control the commodities coming out of the ground, you can force companies to come to your country and build plants to use it. Indonesia is a great example. Well, China, yeah. China with the lithium, they have the largest lithium. Uh, Tesla, oh, okay, come here. Yeah, we'll give you the lithium, but come here and build a factory. Yep. But now they're developing these sodium ion batteries that they don't use lithium or cobalt, and they say they're just as good. Well, yeah, assuming that the technology works. Yeah. Assuming that the silicon replaces graphite, you can get a battery 3,000 miles a car on. 
build batteries to get 3,000 instead of 300. Yeah, and the, and the fuel cells, if they built the hydrogen if charging, you can charge, they charge in three minutes, and yeah. they get 19, 930 30 miles. To, that's pretty good. It is, but the fuel, but the fuel cells are for some use. I know. I don't know why we didn't go in that to have hydrogen charge three minutes. It's expensive. Oh, I know it is. I think there was a that ran out. Yeah, but did you? Yeah, I was listening to a guy yesterday on the build, build back the Inflation Reduction Act and the the subsidies and that the government credits. You can pile with that. You can pile tax credits on top top of tax credits and for like indefinitely. Yeah. That is a, a government giveaway. That whole program. He's talking about how many. You can pile the environmental tax credits on top of the employee tax credits on top of DEI tax credits. They said it's just on top of on top of for for extended periods. Yeah, and you know that's gonna until the government takes away the tax credit, it becomes a really good deal for people that are involved with that. Yeah, we talked about carbon recapture. It's uh-huh. extremely expensive. It's double the cost. If I want to build a plant to mine to uh, for natural gas, double the cost to the carbon recap. But the government yeah. subsidies make it. About the same price. As long as the government subsidies remain. Yeah, exactly. As soon as they go away. 2033, they go away, yeah. according to the cap carbon. But commodities themselves, I mean, we're in a world that's very, very different than seven. And, you know, the capacity for, for drillers, the capacity for miners, has to be increased significantly for commodities to, or the price has to rise. And the assumption is that with inflation, maybe you get price increases in income. But it's not a sure thing. It's not like the 1970s where you could invest in Apache oil and see your stock price increase, even though the stock market was going. To me, it doesn't make a lot of sense to think about commodity investment at a time when commodities are controlled in a lot of places outside the U.S. Mm -hmm. Nickel in Indonesia, lithium in China, (laughs) molybdenum is a ganda. In cobalt, it's all in Africa. In Africa. And so you're at the disposal the mercy of those countries furnish those products. And what will they what will they charge for them? Who knows? And if they can't get enough, will they cut the price dramatically? And are you willing to take the risk of a foreign foreign stock? I know the guy for Barron's Jack Ho, he's kind of a funny and he did this article a few weeks ago about investments we maybe talk about it later on, but all, he said like all you really need is investments in in the S and P five hundred stocks and the P five hundred to do well. He said you don't need commodities, you don't need structured invest structured notes or anything like that or foreign all these complicated investments because just as you said, you're stuck at the whims of these governments. He said, and all the companies in the S and P five hundreds we talked about have 40 percent of their return uh, uh, revenues are from overseas, so you're it's, getting re- exposure. And if you want oil exposure instead of buying commodities, buy Exxon, buy Mobil, whatever, buy one of those companies. If you want commodity companies, if you want wheat, buy uh, Archer Daniels Midland. They do soybeans and control that stuff. You're getting expo- exposure. You don't need to go to these extraneous solutions to diversify your portfolio. You know what did Peter Lynch call it? Diver- diversification. Yep. On the other hand, when you think about the 1970s. That strategy did not work um, because there were so many companies that were going down when other companies were going up that it dragged the whole thing down. 1966, the Dow peaked at 1,000 and dropped 2%. 1968, the Dow was at 1,000 again, it dropped 30%. 1972, Dow was at 1,000, it dropped 40%. So um, just being in the S&P 500 is probably a losing strategy. What we've seen with the inverted yield curve is that we know that recessions always have an inverted yield curve. Mm-hmm. But inverted yield curves don't always mean a recession. Yeah, and in, in, in the S&P 500, I can't remember that since 2000, the last like five years, it's been up like 11.3%. And this, uh, the index, uh, the Cape, Cape Schiller Index, is out of the measure this, you know, they said there was up about 38 before the dot-com crash. It's up about 33 right now, measures the ratios of PEs to the stocks and the whole mm-hmm. S&P 500. And so the prediction is that after the next, because you've been up 11.3%, over the next 10 years, the S&P 500 probably not going to do that well. Don't go away. We'll be right back after this commercial break. About Money continues. Remember, the website, adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Here's your AFC team, Mike and Al. So talking about the inverted yield curve as a side tangent reminds me of Paul Samuelson's economics textbook. Back in the 50s and 60s and 70s, everybody read Paul Samuelson's textbook textbook. It was the most popular, probably 90% of economic students use that. Uh, one of my professors at Carnegie was George Lee Lombach, who wrote the second most popular textbook that had about 5% of the I mean. Um But Samuelson w- opened one chapter by saying, the stock market has correctly predicted five of the last nine recessions. No, I got it reversed. 
correctly predicted nine of the last five recessions. So <clears throat> depending upon the inverted yield curve to predict a recession is has it in reverse. Recessions always have an inverted yield curve, but yield curves don't always have to have be followed by a recession. I think looking at and thinking about this concept that you can diversify into the standard and poor's 500 the and think that you're going to get through a period of time of great inflation is something that we saw in the 1960s and 70s did not work and i believe there's a reason it did and i believe the probability is it won't work when we come to the next next period of time inflation one of the the things that grew out of the last inflation period of time was the inflation bonds the treasury inflated i bond the idea is the coupon rate adjusts with the consumer price index. So if the consumer price index goes up, the coupon, you get paid more. You get paid in relation to, to inflation. Seems like a brilliant concept, right? Did it work? No. <laughs> inflation bonds, $100 inflation when it's five. Yep. It, they work well, but as long as the Fed isn't raising interest, well, when they start raising interest, bond goes. So you have two things with the bond. You have the interest rate they pay and the price. The interest rate goes up, but the price goes down. And the price goes down a lot more than the increase in the coupon interest. And so 17, last year, like 17 billion. Yep. So for all the, it's one of those popular Wall Street things where they come up, you have brilliant Wall Street guys come up with these brilliant ideas, have a bond where the coupon increases with the rate of inflation and you'll stay up with the rate of inflation. You'll, yeah, or you'll be, you'll slightly, Yeah. depending on the interest rate. You yeah. Sadly, you may have a good interest rate, but you lose your principal. Anyway, inflation, it's coming. Uh, in all probability, we're going to see inflation tick back up rather than slide back down. Will we get to 2%? Probably, probably not. Will we get much higher than 10%? There's a possibility. Anyway, that's down the road. We'll see it. We'll keep you informed as we go along and stay on top of it. We have an await. By the way, we do have an approach that we're using for our client, which we think will work through the inflation narrative time. But that wraps that up. We want to turn Kevin Maud was on our program in 2015, just eight years ago, nine years ago, Good. nine years ago. Anyway, at that time, he was the owner and CEO of a company called B47. Yeah, B47 Studios. B47 Studios. Today, you have launched a new venture. Yeah, we launched a new venture uh, last summer called Apex D47 Studios, more about strategy of utilizing video, how to connect audience. Before we get to that, Let's start with your background. Tell us about your background. Yeah, so I went to school for film and video production. And during that time, uh, graphical internet developed and I got really... Um, as I moved to Seattle, I started to explore, you know, how can you connect audience and connect meaningfully uh, through the internet? And I really got into that. And being able to, you talked about earlier, flatten out that, flatten out those connections to the world. Uh, be able to talk to somebody in Africa or be able to get, engage and get new points of view. So I explored a lot of that through Avenue uh, Launch G40 studios through that and learned a lot from it and launched but most of them have been geared towards uh, some sort of visual right. tell tell us about yeah so our business right now we're really uh what we do is we like to identify uh what your goals are, what you're trying to accomplish and design a strategy that utilizes video content so we know that video really resonates well with perspective clients partners or even current partners and, um, because it builds an emotional connection that is light and once you have that emotional connection you're able to build an audience that knows likes and trusts you and once you have that they'll start to buy from you when they're ready because today many people believe that you know oh i gotta go target these people right now right at this very moment but they might not be ready the stat is only three percent of buyers are ready to buy it but if you can nurture the 7 percent when they're ready so when you talk about nurturing, how do you do that? So it's really about bringing value, bringing value to them and giving them knowledge, understand what they're trying to. So in case Mike, the radio show, great example of how to be able to bring them value, bring them insights and help them be educated in the market about, you know, investing. So talk about a typical type of client that you would have. Yeah, most of our clients are geared to, or we're working with a lot of entrepreneurs in subjects. So a lot of might have businesses in a stagnant place, have been doing old form marketing, business development, um, and are looking to grow, utilize LinkedIn quite a bit for, but also we utilize content and build strategy and learning the viewers. So it's really about 
we work a lot with entrepreneurs, subject, and then uh, those that have addressed. So we'll get uh, some clients that are trying and find the right audience because often business owners believe they understand who they want to be talking. Their messaging might, or their message or their might resonate with completely different unknown to be able to speak to them a lot better and see a lot more your investment going a lot further. I take the- yeah, it really depends on kind of the life cycle of your business. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, somebody that might have a small audience now, uh, you might see some progress in a couple months. Um, some in some of the affinity group, uh, work that we're doing, that does take a little bit longer because we have to get a lot of eyeballs there to right, right. go against. Um, so that can take up six months to really start. It could be as short as three months. But, you know, those that have an audience, you might see it quickly. Um, those that were having to really develop the audience, understand who that audience, it could take, you know, a couple months uh, to start to see that as a magic bullet anywhere right. that's going to get you right away. But, yeah, so it's all about getting that content out, to hit them, develop it. Content is the real rub. You know, rubber hits the road, I guess, right? Is content that is pertinent to the people you want to target, and that's going to give kind of give them something, give, give them, giving it away a little yeah. to kind of draw them. Yeah, so showing showing that you're an expert, showing yeah. that you can give them value um, right. just by giving them, you know, simple insights or giving them, you know, this is how I got started in doing this or this is something to think about as you're considering a move in your business. Um, you know, kind of guiding them along those ways in getting them to understand your belief, but also being unique in that position um, so that you... So give us an example of a potential client. So a potential client for for Apex? Yeah. Uh, so a business owner that's probably been in their business uh, generating a million in revenue, um, but have been has been stagnant um, and is really looking at how they can, or wanting to grow their business, but have been struggling to find the audience to grow it and bring in. And so the process that you would go through with that business? Yeah, so our process um, right now, we actually have designed a new process for our thought leadership. We have a no-cost uh, Kickstarter program that basically goes in, helps you to identify your brand. And by identifying your brand, it creates an emotion, understand the emotional connection, create with the audience. Then we go in and create a video, uh, brand video. And then from there, we create a content. And that's all at a no-cost program. And then from there, it goes into a subscription model where we're creating pieces or video content with you on a monthly then to resonate. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, we, we think it's a, a fairly good offer and a lot of people be interested in it. It's finding the time to do it. We'll be right back after this commercial and we'll let you know how you can reach Kevin and that will be coming right up. Don't go away. Stay with us. About Money with the AFC team, Mike and Al on AM 1300, The Answer. For more information, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. So we're here with Kevin Mudd. Kevin, tell us, Quickly, what your tell us what your your business does, and then tell tell the listener how they can reach you. Yeah, so Apex Studios, we build strategies for business growth with video com- by engaging audiences and help them to grow your business. Uh, to reach me, uh, my company is Apex Studios, and it's apexstudios.io. And my email is Kevin at apexstudios.io, and I can also be found on LinkedIn. Uh, profile is so say it all again. Uh, that's. <laughs> he threw him off, Mike. Yeah. He said it once really good. Come on. Had it all down pat. <laughs> yeah, no, we build uh, strategies through video content. Uh, and Or we build strategies to grow business video that help you. And you can find me at AIO is website. Email address is Kevin. Find me on LinkedIn. Perfect. Thanks for being on thanks, the program. Kevin. Yeah, thanks for Appreciate having me. Talk, yeah, great talk. With so John Train wrote a book called The Money Masters. And he talked about some of the very few, actually, money masters who truly were able to outperform the market, deliver superior results. And I take a quote from that because John Train wrote, there's no luck to professional portfolio investing. It's a craft involving thousands of decisions a year. You can no more pile up a superlative record by luck or accident than you can win a chess tournament by luck or by accident. That's how John Train described it. And... At Adams Financial Concepts, that's been our focus. We have a passion for creating wealth for our clients. Clients who don't accept average or mediocre. Clients who don't want to reduce their tax liability. Clients that want to leave something for their heirs. Clients that don't want to reduce their quality of life, even in periods of inflation. And clients who want to win. Is that how you would describe it? Yeah, I'm just, huh? I'm just laughing at the client who just left this. Uh, Should we talk about that? <laughs> sure. <laughs> 
So we just lost it. It's really, it took me a year to bring this account. And he brought over a nice chunk of change. He was in this convoluted structure and we're never going to book Spencer. And he just moved the account on a whim. The account was up 21.25% and he moved the account. And before that, he was getting 3%. Yeah, he was get lucky to get 3% because he was paying about 35 So if he got 3%, he was still losing a half a percent. And he moved and I said, why did you move it? His brother told him, what does your brother do? Experience? Well, his brother, a professor, a professor of finance. No, he's a professor of Middle East study. I'm like, oh, that has a good, you know, maybe he's got an inroad with the Shah, I don't know, some new oil. I was flab flab again. There's no plan. I'm moving it here. And, and okay. he's retired. Yeah. No, he's still working. Still working, okay. Yeah. But I'm just flabbergasted. I could see if he was down 21%, I could understand. <laughs> but who moves an account? You know, sometimes in my career, and I've been in this business now for 30 years, sometimes people move their accounts. You wonder really why. Uh, I had one client that moved their account because they were making too much money and paying too much in tax. <laughs> I said, I can cure that if you want me to. We'll just lose money for a while. <laughs> I said, the option is not to make as much money or to lose money. I mean, if if your account goes from one million to a million and a half and you have to pay taxes on half a million dollars, isn't that better than and paying 20% capital gains, so paying 100,000 in taxes? Isn't that better than seeing your account go from one million to one million 100,000 and paying 20,000 in taxes? Wouldn't you rather pay 200,000 and have your account at one and a half rather than pay 20,000 in taxes and go to 1.1? It's hard no, to figure out some people's moved. rationale. You know. Like I had a guy do that last year, Mike. He complained about, he was comparing me against the YLS with Donald. His account was 1.2 over like two months. It's not really a good comparison. Then our account started to do well. We're up like 30%. He moves the account. I said, you're up 30? Well, you don't like making money, I guess. Okay. So it's a funny, <laughs> it's a people funny move business. for funny reasons. I'm, yeah. Way back when, back in the, the 80s, when bond prices, <clears throat> bond prices were, were falling off. Interest rates were coming down. Volcker had raised rates and the economy was coming back into to line. <clears throat> you could buy bonds at 40 and 50 cents on the dollar. Bonds like Seattle City Light, Tacoma City Light. I remember those bonds. They were a 4% coupon. <clears throat> selling for 40 or 50 cents on the dollar. And you can buy those bonds at that price. And those bonds have been defeased. So when it, the money to pay those bonds off had been invested in treasuries. So the value of those bonds were backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. Could not get anything safer. The prices were 40 to 50 cents on the dollar. And there was some rookie, rookie broker from Kidder that talked to one of my clients that said, you're getting junk bond. That's why you're paying such a low price. <laughs> I don't think he knew what a junk bond was. I, you know, I lost the account because that kidder broker talked that client into thinking that those were junk bond. All you got to do is look at the rating. You can tell what a junk, it's so easy to tell what a junk is. Yeah. That's so great. in those days, What's bond. That, Kevin? Oh, I was going to say, and that's where uh, you producing some content to educate your market. <laughs> yeah, no, you are correct, Kevin. Yeah. You are correct. What's yeah. the difference between a junk bond and a treasury bond and a, uh, and a um, uh, what do they call it, a, a municipal bond, right? I mean, yeah. yeah, that could be the month of April for you. Yeah, there you go. Municipal bonds. I mean, there have been some really strange people. I had one, one woman who bought, <laughs> we bought some stocks and the account was down after two months. It was down about 10%. And she moved the account. Okay, I understand. So a couple years later, I was at Payne Weber when I opened that account. I had then moved on to Dane Bosworth. And a couple years later, she realized this account would have been up 40% instead of being down. So she called Payne Weber and said, where's Mike Adams? Well, he moved to a different firm. He's not with us anymore. I need to know where Mike Adams is. Well, we can't tell you that. I need to know where Mike Adams is. She raised holy whatever to find out where I was and called me up and said, I need to open an account. And I said, as I talked through it, I said, you can't live with something that's down 10%. You can't sleep. I said, you're better off forgetting about 40%, better off just putting the money into CDs and leaving it. Never, never went back. But I mean, that's, that was inappropriate. She wanted to make money, but she wanted risk. If you want to make money, there is a risk. There's well, going to be ups and downs. And Peter Lynch said, go look at Warren Buffett's 58-year track record. He had time, but he missed the market. But he's overall 58-year track. He, he bests the S&P 500 10%. But he had times where he was, they called for his head in what, 2001, 2002, and three. He said his wave investing's over when the A shares of, of Berkshire Hathaway were at 42,000. Now I believe they're over 600,000. Yeah, I remember that time. Yeah, I remember He's lost too. his touch. Yep. I'm sure some people say that about me at times. I say that about me. <laughs> <laughs> but it has nothing to do with investing. <laughs> anyway, that wraps us up for today. 
investing is a tough game. It's not an easy game. And that's why we focus on what we do. We get it. Anyway, that wraps us up for today. We'll be back next Saturday to talk about money. Have a good week and a good week. You've been listening to About Money with registered investment advisors, Mike Adams and Al Souza. If you'd like more information about what you've heard today or about AFC's investment philosophy and strategy, or if you'd like the AFC team to evaluate your own portfolio, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. That's adamsfinancialconcepts.com. The information shared in the preceding program was for educational purposes only, and any investment advice given may not be suitable for all investors. Join us again next Saturday at noon for more About Money with Mike Adams here on AM 1300, The Answer. The preceding program was sponsored by Adams Financial Concepts.